I decided to take a risk. Five years ago, I took my partner Mark on a cruise line which he was not a fan of by the end. So since then, I've had to go solo on them because I really do like them. Now, as they've changed in those five years, I decided I would try to get Mark back on board even though he's adamant that he would prefer we use his limited vacation time to only go on his favorite line, Cunard, when we're cruising together. But I felt if I could get him to like this line, it would unlock so many more exciting places to go because they have way more varied and much more interesting itineraries than you get on Cunard. Welcome aboard, I'm Gary Bembridge. Join me as I explain how it went, but importantly, what I learned about going back on a line you weren't impressed with the first time round. The first challenge was convincing Mark to go back on the line, which is Holland, America. First, I found a cruise that was heading out of San Diego to sunny Mexico for Christmas so we could escape cold London on the Koningsdam. It's one of their new pinnacle class ships. It's bigger and with better facilities versus the Vista class new Amsterdam he'd been on before. It's also the class and the template that the new Cunard Queen Anne is being used to be built. So that of course piqued his interest. Next, I pointed out that we could get a suite for 30% less than the one we usually go in Cunard's Queen Grill. And like with Queen's Grill, we would have a dedicated restaurant called Club Orange. Also, I pushed the entertainment versus Cunard, like the now expanded music walk area with live music rotating every night between Rolling Stone Rock Room, Lincoln Center Stage, BB Kings and Billboard on board. Plus, they've ditched the standard cruise themed song and dance review shows that he found really dull then. And they replaced them with a one step dance company in a modern high tech world stage theater. Also, importantly for him, the sell was it had a big, busy casino, and I promised him many blackjack tables with low table minimums. The final sell, I guess, was the retreat, an exclusive area with a group of cabanas that we could hire for the entire cruise, which was way better and quieter than the busier and rather uninspiring, I think anyway, Queen's Grill decks on Cunard. Now he loves the food in Cunard Queen's Grill. He sees it as the best at sea, and he had found it not great when he were, we were on that Holland America trip. But I told him the food is way better because they've revamped it all. I found through a culinary council, which was led by the chef Rudy Soderman. I also pointed out that we'd have more speciality dining options. On Cunard, we just have the veranda. But on the Pinnacle class ships on Holland America, you got Pinnacle Grill Steakhouse, Tamarind Asian, Nami Sushi, Rudy Saldemar Seafood, and the Italian Canaletto. All of this together clinched it and it was a go. However, the next challenge I faced was once he was on board, as not everything I'd sold him worked out or was exactly to his liking. But through this whole process, I hit on a really big aha that will help you if you plan on going back on or you want someone to go back with you onto a line that they haven't had a great experience with. And that is really understanding what makes or breaks a cruise for you or for them. Now, during this trip, I realized more than I had perhaps realized before what really makes or breaks a cruise for Mark and what things just basically needed to be good enough. Three things I found really make a cruise for Mark and I suspect these may be for you too. First of all, the evenings are absolutely key. For him, that means a good dinner, great entertainment and a very active casino. Dinner, as I mentioned for him, the gold standard is Cunard Queen's Grill, open seated dining, the same table for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the same waiting staff, and being able to, if you want to, order off menu. Club Orange, unfortunately, didn't offer any of that. It had the same menu as the main dining room with one little extra. It was only open for breakfast and dinner. We didn't have the same waiting staff, but you know, it's kind of small venue, so we got to know most of them pretty well, uh, even though we weren't at the same table for every single meal. Club Orange was a bit of a hit and miss, as although it was open seated dining, which he likes, the ship was really busy. And to guarantee a table was available when we arrived, we found we were starting to time our meals around what we thought was availability versus what were our ideal times. But on the plus side, we always, always, always got a table for two. The food on the plus side too, he agreed was way better than it was before. So that was good to know. It was also good enough that he didn't feel the need that we should splash out on specialty restaurants. We did actually go to Italian Canaletto and Tamarind, the Asian, because we actually had some onboard credits to go to them. 
When it came to entertainment, while I had pushed the strength and the difference of Holland America being the music walk venues, it was not of interest to him once he was on board. He didn't really go to them at all. I love going there every night. I think it's great. But if it's not your thing, then the evening options, I guess, if you don't want the music, are perhaps a little bit more limited than I had really estimated. He enjoyed the one-step dance company show and the theatre. Well, the first one. He thought it was fresh, new and exciting. Uh, however, he went to the second show and he said it was just too similar, just with different music, and he skipped the rest of their shows. He probably had a point that the evening shows lacked variety. They were all kind of just permutations of the same old thing. They did have another Holland America staple when we were on board BBC Planet Earth show where the onboard musicians play live to scenes from the show, and that was not of interest to him at all. Though I could see many passengers absolutely loved it. The big casino, though, was a big hit. He played longer than he has ever played on any of the 30 plus cruises that I've been on with him. So, in terms of the evening being make or break, the dinner, entertainment, and casino was a bit more mixed than I had expected it to be. However, the other make or break cruise thing for him is ports and port immersion. This was mixed, but it laid down an important factor in Holland America's favor, as you're about to see. He absolutely loved that we went to ports that neither of us had been to, Cabo San Lucas, Mazatlan, and Puerto Vallarta. However, one critical thing that was missing was Mark and I prefer self-exploring, but there was not that much port immersion provided on this cruise. There was one talk around the ports by the excursion team, but that was mostly around selling the excursions. There were no port guides available in paper or on the app, and there was no transfer bus into the towns when we were docked further away. Mark doesn't want to do research. He wants to be given just good information on board to be able to go and explore. Now, we compared that with Cunard, who usually have really good port immersion talks, great port guides, and I was kind of surprised that we didn't have it on this trip because on most of the Holland America trips, that's normally the case. So this may have been an exception. I'm going to be watching out for that on my next trip, which is to South America. The third key thing that makes or breaks his cruise is the ability to chill and relax. He has a really stressful job, crazy long hours, so on vacation he basically wants to unwind. Now, Holland America delivered big time here because we had a couple of sea days, but the really critical thing that made it for him was the retreat, especially because the ship was so full for Christmas. The retreat was a quiet area with great service. We had Raymond, Clyde, and Annika who fetched breakfast, lunch, drinks, and even brought us chocolate-covered strawberries in the afternoon. However, this did come at a cost of a few hundred dollars, but it was absolutely worth that cost. I also came to realize through this whole process that there were things that I thought were going to be make or break, but for Mark just had to be good enough to make a cruise for him. It's something I think may also be helpful for you as you think about taking people on cruises as well. The biggest of these was the cabin. I'm obsessed about cabins and their location, but for Mark, while he really liked the suite and made the point that the Neptune suite is bigger than the ones we usually afford to book on Cunard Queen's Grill, he didn't see that as a big make or break, unlike me. Though, of course, the category going in the suite was a big plus factor for him. He realized, though, that he didn't miss having the butler you get on Cunard, but he did rave about the Neptune Lounge, the ability through the day to call in and get cake pops, cookies, coffees, but more importantly about Vinny, who was the concierge in there. Vinny was helpful. He added to Mark's trip with tips and advice, and importantly, he sorted out the retreat booking, which had been showing as fully booked before the trip. That alone made Vinny a hero, but that having Vinny was a big, big plus. Interestingly, and maybe not a typical, is the other thing that he felt only had to be good enough on the cruise was the daily program. Now, while he felt that the Holland America daily program was a little light, I pointed out the comparison with Cunard is always difficult because they have one of the most packed daily programs of any I have ever seen. I think it's a hangover from their transatlantic experiences. The program on Holland America was basically the same as most premium lines with trivia, deck games, dance classes, the odd cooking demonstration, and so on. But the reality is Mark never, ever does much on the program other than enrichment talks. He really enjoys these, and it's hard to beat Cunard to have three to four speakers on every selling. Holland America were really light on enrichment this time. There were a few of the standard pre-prepared talks they do with audiovisual effects. 
They're given by the cruise director. They do these on all of the ships. They include things like Honor America Origin Story. They still have board games, but they're not the same as the genuine, authentic specialist enrichment lectures. He didn't find any of these appealing. The other thing he pointed out, there was a lot of promotion on board and in the daily program. To Honor America's credit, in the daily program, they were clearly marked what were promotional activities in the program. But it did some days seem half or more of the activities during the day were promotions, including the inevitable port shopping talk and events. To see where he felt after all of this, I decided to ask him at the end of the cruise if he had the choice of us booking seven nights on Cunard or 10 nights on Holland America, because that would roughly equate at the same cost, say in the Mediterranean or the Caribbean and roughly the same ports, which would he choose? Seven nights, Cunard, 10 nights, on Holland America. He chose the seven nights on Cunard, but agreed that Holland America would be a great option if the itinerary was unique and Cunard didn't do it, like the one we did in Mexico. So Holland America is back on his list, so some success just needs to look for those itineraries. If you find this interesting, watch this video to find out why, in more detail, Mark likes Cunard so much, starting with the one thing they do that no other line does. See you over there.